Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Ron Brownstein, a senior, what is your important title? Senior editor at The Atlantic, mm -hmm. senior analyst on CNN, a veteran uh, reporter and analyst of American politics, one of the ones I've learned the most from over the years and generally one of the most respected, mm -hmm. I think. Early in seeing some of the trends that we're now seeing uh, manifesting themselves, I think, that we saw in the mm -hmm. 2016 election. But let's, let's come back to the history yes. and begin with where we are, what happened in 2016? One-off fluke or something no, more I, significant? No, I, I think of, first of all, it's great to be here with you, Bill. Uh, I think of 2016 as the culmination, really, of long-term trends. I, and both trends in the competition between the parties, but also trends in the way the public relates to the political system. I met you in 1985, I believe, when you were the precocious prodigy chief of staff at a very young age to uh, Bill Bennett at the Education Department. I came to Washington in 85. And, That's very right. nice of you. The check's and, in the mail for that. Right. That yeah. was excellent. Yes, yeah. and I was, I was at least a younger reporter at that point. And, with, you the know, LA, with the LA Times. Uh, National no. Journal at that point, no. then the LA Times. The LA Times. Um, and, you know, that was the first presidential campaign I covered in 1984. And I think the first point to under thinking about 2016 is um, I find it hard to imagine that 30 years ago or even 15 years ago that Donald Trump or, for that matter, Bernie Sanders, would have gotten nearly as far as they did yeah. in the primaries. I mean, between them, they won 25 million votes in the primaries. Each one about 45 percent. Yeah, yeah, of, of, the, their, party, of right? their own party, right? Yeah. And if you, you know, I think if you look back, uh, I do not think nearly as many people would have said they crossed the threshold that I expect right. in a commander-in-chief. But I think what has happened over the last generation, for a lot of different reasons we can talk about, is that the public has lost an enormous amount of faith in conventional political leadership in the same way that faith has eroded in all sorts of other institutions, whether it's business leaders, labor leaders, media figures, uh, pretty much everything short of the military and maybe nonprofits in your immediate orbit. And I think what, that's, what that did is that it made more people open to, set, to looking at something outside of the usual parameters. And in fact, the fact that Trump was something different was an important part of his appeal right. to the voters drawn to him, even as it you know, repelled a lot of other voters. So that's the, I think that's the first threshold. I mean, the, the personal characteristics, the qualities, the style, the tenor, the tone, all of those things, I have a hard time imagining that really getting off the ground in, say, 1992. And, right. and I, think, I think we see, uh, uh, you know, uh, and 1992 is a good example because Ross Perot got to 19%. Right. Uh, you know, and Donald And Pat Trump, Buchanan. And Pat Buchanan. Got some votes right. in the primaries. You got a, you, you, there was a limit. Now, in terms of the actual competition, once you got down to Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, you know, there's a tendency to look at this as, as a one-off or something. In fact, what we saw, and we can talk about this in more length, is all of the demographic and geographic trends that had been resorting and resegmenting the electorate uh, that in many ways go back to the 80s and 90s, all of them were intensified in this election. I mean, I think this election took every fault line in American life, and it just drove an earthquake right through them. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's not the kind of conventional, this was so different from the previous no, ones. This it was, was just the bigger. End. It was more. Yeah, it so was let's more. talk, about, so talk right. about some of those. So guys. look, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the story, the big story of American politics, I mean, there's a lot of big stories, but it is that uh, over roughly the last 30 years, I mean, you can, you can trace it back to the 1960s, certainly, and, and that's true. But really, since the Reagan era, I think we have been living through an overlapping geographic and demographic sorting out and resorting of the parties. Um, you know, we have a Democratic Party that increasingly since the Bill Clinton era uh, in the 90s runs best among young people, minorities, and more is stronger among college-educated white-collar whites than among blue-collar whites, which were the heart of the party uh, from, you know, Franklin Roosevelt through uh, basically Jimmy Carter. And the geographic corollary of all of this is that increasingly the party support is concentrated in the biggest urban areas, which are diverse, which are culturally tolerant, which are mostly post-industrial, which are integrated into the global economy. And so you have this kind of upstairs, downstairs coalition that is largely centered on whites above the median income who are professionals and working class minorities. I mean, that is, that is pretty much the Democratic coalition, and it's overwhelmingly revolving around cities, even when Clinton won in 92 and 96. Yeah, I was going to ask, isn't Clinton the... Like Clinton's, yeah, Clinton, yeah, Clinton's said, the last... Were you the one who invented the beer... Beer, beer track and wine track. Beer track yes. and wine track during the, the primary, Democratic primary. During the primary, right. And that's the idea that, you, that there's usually a candidate, one candidate who relies on working class white voters and minorities, and one candidate who is more the... Um, 
a candidate of white upper middle class Volvo liberals, you know, and almost always the beer track candidate has beaten the wine track candidate until you get to Obama who kind of moved African Americans out of the beer category, combined it with the white upper middle class against Clinton who had Hispanics, which are growing, and blue collar whites and beat her by, you know, that much. In fact, there are some tallies that conclude she won more votes. Right. Uh, ultimately than he did in 2008. But so you have this Democratic Party that I think is a, you know, essentially a coalition, I believe, of voters who are largely comfortable with both the economic and especially cultural and demographic change that the country is living through. It's, it's, it's heavily urbanized. Bill Clinton, uh, who was still trying to hold on to more of blue-collar, religious, non-urban America. Both of his elections, he won half the counties in America, almost exactly half the counties. By the time Obama won re-election in 2012, he was down to less than a quarter of the counties. So he wins a majority of the vote. He wins, he wins by 5 million votes, but he only he wins less than 700 counties. He wins fewer counties in winning than Michael Dukakis won in losing. Wow. He won fewer than any winner in at least the last 100 years until you get to Hillary Clinton. You know, you fast forward four years further, she wins the popular vote by about, you know, three mil- almost 3 million votes. She wins fewer than 500 counties. She wins... Just eight- to be clear, what are the, how many counties in America? 3,100. 3,100. She wins eight... Here's, here's the one that... Here's the statistic that I think is really kind of relevant. She wins 88 of the 100 largest counties, okay? Donald Trump wins 2,600 of the other 3,000. He wins more counties than any candidate in either party since Reagan in 84. Just think about that. Donald Trump won more counties wow. than anybody since Ronald Reagan. And, uh, you know, essentially he consolidated w- and intensified, uh, you know, what has been the movement toward a Republican coalition that is strongest among blue collar whites, religiously devout whites. I mean, that's something that goes all the way back to Reagan, evangelicals and the most church going Catholics and then non-urban whites. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, and what, what Trump did was, it really was the death of a thousand cuts for Clinton. He beat her everywhere that Romney might have won by two, he won by 10. If uh, Obama won by three, he won by five. Outside of these big urban centers. Uh, Where the he Democrat- did worse, incidentally. What's that? Where Trump did worse than- But he did worse. He lost, he lost them by more. He, he lost them by even more than Romney lost. <laughs> Obama won 86 of the 100 largest counties. Clinton won 88. And that includes, you know, not just- the counties in New York and San Francisco and Austin and Dallas and, right. and, and I mean, Austin and Seattle and uh, Denver, kind of the centers of the new economy. I mean, she won Dallas County. I mean, she won Harris County with Houston. She won counties around uh, Atlanta. Um, uh, density and the kind of the post-industrial, I, I mean, I believe these things have kind of converged. And we now have a situation where you have a Democratic Party that is basically comfortable both with economic and cultural change. And, and, and the economic side is more disputed because of the Sanders side. And you have a Republican coalition that is largely, you know, it's predominantly white, still 90% of uh, Trump's votes came from whites, heavily blue collar, older, more, relig- more religiously devout, mostly outside of the urban centers, much more tied to traditional manufacturing, much more tied to resource extraction. One more kind of cool stat that I think gets at this. Um, if you look at, one thing I've tried to look at the last few elections is I rank state, the, the energy department ranks states by per capita emissions of carbon, <laughs> okay? And um, that basically tells you two things. It, is it a resource extraction state and is it a manufacturing state? Because the manufacturing states tend to be the states that rely on coal more because it's been, it, has, it has historically been the cheapest. Of the 32 states that emit the most carbon per person, Trump won 27 of them. <laughs> of the 18 that emit the least, which are mostly post-industrial states along the coast, Clinton won 15 of them. Wow. So, you know, so two I, Americas, in a two way. Americas, two Americas, and you know, it's the same, pretty much the same in the House. It's worth going back for people who don't remember this. I mean, 88 election yes. when after we met each other, and the election I was marginally involved in uh-huh. that you covered. Yeah. I mean, Bush no. won. California, yeah. New Jersey, right, right. I believe. And, and, and Dukakis then, won a lot of rural counties. Right, and, and you Democrats didn't have this kind them. of red, blue... Right, the map, uh, as I said, Dukakis won more counties in losing than, than right. Obama won in winning. Right. Um, so and, really I, you know, you go back to the 70s, uh, Jimmy Carter only won about 55 of the 100 largest counties. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of places. But, you know, we have sorted out. Uh, I mean, two things have happened. The party's appeals have become more divergent. And the, the distance between them and kind of the, the signals they're sending to voters, but also we have sorted out in where right. we live. I mean, the great statistic uh, that my friend Bill Bishop, who wrote The Big Sort, 
uh, uh, you know, provides is that in this election, in the 2016 election, 60 percent of us lived in counties that were decided by 20 points or more. Wow. That's a big... In a close election. In a close election. In a, 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 a 2.0, 2, 3 two, percentage point right, election. Right, exactly. Yeah. We had, you know, and that's far more than in the 70s, in, say, the Carter-Ford election, which was comparable, you know, uh, closeness. Um, and the House is very similar. 80 percent of the House Republicans are in districts that are more white than the national average. Two-thirds of the Democrats are in districts that are more non-white. Uh, Two-thirds of the, uh, three-quarters of the House Republicans are in districts with fewer white college graduates than the national average. Two-thirds of the Democrats are in districts with more. And the last one, 60 percent of the House Republicans are in districts with, with the median age is above the national average, 60 percent of the Democrats below. So you see just this, you know, and, 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 and what Trump did in many ways, like I, I think I look at it geographically, if you look at where the Republicans made the breakthroughs in the House in 2010 and 2014, when they essentially exterminated what you and I grew up calling the blue dog Democrats, right. kind of the rural conservative John Spratt, John Murtha, Ike Skelton Democrats, Obama held enough of those places in 2012, especially in the Midwest, in the upper Midwest, and they all fell to Trump this time. I mean, Clinton could not hold almost any of them. And, was that uh, more, do you think, because of Obama and Clinton or because of Romney and Trump? Romney more, uh, I think a little combination of both. I mean, what, what, what Obama was able to do to Romney, right. Clinton could not do to Trump, right? I mean, he, they made, him, make him he made him a class enemy. Yeah. He made him the guy who came to town in the limo and took away all your jobs. You know, it's funny, a year before the election, one of the advisors to the super PAC on the, on the Democratic side said to me that the single most important thing to do was to disqualify Trump as a legitimate champion of the working class. And then they never really, they, yeah. th that was not their message at all. Their, their entire message was aimed at white collar, white America, that he is morally unacceptable. You want your kids looking at this guy for the right. next four years. And that simply was and not relevant enough. And he has bad enough. character and bad, bad judgment. Character, he bad might blow judgment. the world up, might but not, the world the, not, that he, not that he would betray working class economic interests. Absolutely. And so I think a lot of working class white voters in the Midwest, where this election was decided, and then we should come back to one point about that, uh, kind of looked at that argument and said, yeah, this is not a perfect human being. But I do not hear anything from you about how you're going to make my life better. And he at least is talking about people like me. Uh, you know, one of the data crunchers after, I mean, obviously the data crunchers were kind of, you know, including myself, all of us were kind of trying to figure out what happened. And one of the Democratic data crunchers said to me, I, I looked at this election as incredibly simple in one respect, that in a lot of these communities that were losing ground, that it felt bypassed economically, culturally, it, she, said, she went like this. She went, it's like, I see you. It's like, Trump, I, you know, I see you. Uh, and Hillary Clinton never conveyed that. The Democratic Convention certainly didn't convey that. It was all about celebrating the new and changing America, which is the heart of the Democratic coalition. But the asterisk on all of this stuff that I have written and others have written over the years is that, that co for that coalition to be a majority, it depended on one anomaly, which was running much better in the Midwest among working class whites than you did elsewhere. So if you looked at Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Pennsylvania. From 2000 to 2012, I'm doing this by memory, but I'm pretty sure it's right. In each of those elections, so that's like 20 cases, no, 20 cases. In all 20 of those cases, the Democratic nominee ran better among non-college whites in all five of those states than they did nationally. Mm. Now, Clinton also ran better than she did nationally, but the gap converged. She cratered among working class whites in the Midwest, and that more than anything else is what elected Donald Trump. And you, I, I mean, we were on a train together, and yeah. I remember this, what, I yeah. think Friday before the Friday election? Friday before the election. And, and we both actually thought Trump had a chance. I mean, we thought Hillary would win. Right, it was right, three to right, right. Three and right, four, four right, and five that she right. would win. But, and I think you said at the time that something with, that Hillary had spent more time in yeah. which states? So, well, so yeah, the, 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 you know. Well, you, you wrote that. Even. I did write that. I wrote, yeah, that, yeah. I wrote that about uh, eight days out. That she had spent, we were discussing the article you yeah, had written. Yeah, she had spent... Um, so, you know, historically, the Democratic coalition has, you know, in the modern era, since, since Bill Clinton, first of all, before that, if you go from 1968 to 1988, Republicans won the presidency five out of six times. Right. In the three elections of the 1980s, you know, ones that you're very familiar with, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Republicans won a larger share of the total electoral, available electoral college votes than any party had won over three consecutive elections since the formation of the modern party system in 1828, which means that the Democrats did better in the 1860s when they were the party of secession and rebellion 
than they did in the, you know, in the, in the 1980s. And then you get Bill Clinton and his kind of reformation of the party, and he restores their ability to compete at the national level. And uh, you have a party that is basically centered on the two coasts, but is strong in a series of uh, Midwestern states, Illinois, Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Ohio, four out of the six times from uh, uh, 1992 to 2012. Um, and so they had this, you know, they had this kind of coalition, uh, and the Sun Belt was mostly out of reach, although they, they, did, they, were, they were able to win Florida three times, I think, out of those, out of those six. Um, but Arizona, Georgia, places like that where that were demographically changing were still out of reach largely because they could not win as many white-collar whites as they did on the coasts or in the upper Midwest. So Clinton kind of looked at this map and um, said, you know, essentially concluded that the Midwest was more secure than it was and put enormous effort into they what... they had won those states. They had won those what, states. Five of six or six well, of they, six, six times. Of, they, had won, they had won... They had, won, they had won Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania six of six. They had won Iowa five of six, and they had won Ohio four of six. Yeah. And they looked at those three, the Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, which were in what I had termed, my phrase, the blue wall right. from 2009, which was the states that Democrats had won six straight times. And they looked at that, and they said, okay, you know, these are pretty secure. Not Pennsylvania. They fought for Pennsylvania, but the other two, Michigan and Wisconsin. So we can put all of our money and time into our reach states. You know, and the, the, the three big ones were uh, Florida, North Carolina, and Ohio, um, as well as a little dabbling in Arizona. But the big three were Florida, Ohio, and North Carolina, none of which were in the first 270 she would need to win. But all of which were very tempting because they'd been so incredibly close in exactly. so many 2000, 2004, but what, what 2012. But the, the imbalance, the imbalance got to the point where she had spent on television as of late October, $180 million in, in North Carolina, Ohio, and Florida, and six in Michigan and Wisconsin. She had not visited them up until the last week of the election since the primaries. Right. Um, and but then- Pennsylvania, so the Clinton- Pennsylvania, they say, fought. They yeah. did fight Pennsylvania. They did, they fought Pennsylvania as hard as you could, and that- Though even there, maybe they fought it too much in the Philadelphia they suburbs, did. is that yeah. true? And they didn't fight in the western they, part they, of the state? And, and, they, and they basically conceded the middle, right? And that was kind of the story. And I think one thing Democrats have to learn from this election is that margins matter. And, you know, it is pretty clear that a modern Democratic Party that is pro-gay rights, pro-transgender rights, pro-climate action, pro-citizenship for undocumented immigrants, pro-free uh, contraception under Obamacare, and five other things that we can name, they are not going to win most non-college whites. They're not going to win most rural communities. They're certainly not going to win, you know, most evangelical whites. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can allow the floor to fall out, yeah. right? And um, I think one of the, the clearest lessons is you have to end up, you have to fight in those communities. You have to find a place where you can make at least some stand and try to prevent what I described before, this death by a thousand cuts, where Trump just magnified the margin everywhere. Now, he's, I think, is giving them openings because he's not governing in a way that reflects right. the values, maybe the values, the interests of those voters um, as nearly as much as he promised. So there is that opening, but you have to find a way to talk to those voters at least somewhat. You have to sand down the edges of the, of the, you know, the, the blade. Were they made overconfident by the notion that demography is on their side? There are more yeah. and more college-educated people. Younger people are not dying at the rate older people are dying, and uh, uh, more and more minorities. So they just sort of had to, s Obama won 52 and then 51 percent. Right. Why wouldn't Clinton win right. 51 or 52 right. percent look, against I mean, a very flawed candidate? Against a very flawed candidate. And I think that um, you know, people like me probably contributed to that. Belief because the electorate is continuing to change, and uh, even here, here, you know, but turnout matters and margins matter, right. right? So even in this election, it's a really important point. So I mean, the basic story of the electorate is has been getting more diverse and better educated. I mean, we have two sources of data on who votes. We we have met, we have more, but the two main sources are the census and the exit poll, right? And they have, they're, they're different in their level, but the, the, but the basic story is the same. They each show that every four years, uh, going back to the early 1990s, the minority share of the vote has increased about two points, the college-educated share has gone up slightly, and the white non-college share, 
the, the, what has become you know, the core of the Trump coalition, has declined. And in fact, even in this so election, give us a sense of those numbers. So sure. So um, I, mean, I think uh, the change is pretty. Stu this, it happens slowly every one or two percent every four years. Right. But over comparing the Reagan electorate to the so the Reagan electorate, Trump electorate is pretty startling. The Reagan electorate was roughly speaking two thirds of the voters were non college whites. Uh, then about another 25 percent, a little less than 25 percent, were college whites, and then the last 10 percent, or 12, I think, yeah, we're, 10, 12 percent were minorities, depending on whether it's 80 or 84. Uh, when Bill Clinton was elected the first time, a majority of the voters in both the exit poll and the census were still non-college whites. Wow. Um, but as I said, they have they have declined steadily. And so now where are they? About? So they uh, in the in the census. They are 42 percent of the vote. In the exit poll, they're 34 percent of the vote. So that's the biggest difference in who, who responds. And, and, and the answer is probably somewhere in between. But it almost doesn't matter because they, they show they started from a different place, the census and the exit, but they, but they, show the same they say slope. movement, two points every four years. What didn't happen this year is the minority share of the vote did not go up its usual two points every four years. And that was because of turnout. It's, it, it's, it's the, the, the census gives you a second data source, which is the eligible, the potential voter pool. And that, in that, the eligible voter pool, the minority share of the vote increased two points again from oh. 2012 to 2016. It's going to increase two points every four years in eligible voters, probably, you know, as far as we can see. But because African-American turnout significantly declined, uh, the biggest decline from election to election that we've recorded among African-Americans, and because Hispanic turnout, rather shockingly, did not improve. Yeah, that's them. You'd expect maybe African American turnout to go down to right. the first African American right. president. Right. But, no but Hispanic turnout did not go up. Yeah, that's. It went up in a couple places. It went up in Arizona, it went up in Nevada, but it did not go up overall, which I think has to be very daunting for Democrats. Because the turnout didn't go up, despite the potential increase in the minor, it, it, it basically stayed the same or, or, or increased about half a point or a point, and that hurt her. Uh, millennials, uh, their turnout improved a little but not as much. And there she was really hurt, I think not so much by turnout as by the bleed off to Gary Johnson and Jill Stein. Yeah, what about millennials? So if someone yeah. like me who's a, yeah. I think still a Republican and certainly a conservative and worries most about Trump, just, I mean, how can, mm. how can you have a party going forward? Right. And there are already your dem demographic trends that are somewhat unfavorable to the Republican Party right. or to conservatives, and they needn't be maybe with a different Republican message and messengers, but anyway, they have been, which right. is empirically, what now, six or seven elections since the end of the Cold War, Democrats have won the plurality of the popular vote. And, by the way, which has never happened before in American history in, in, since 1828. No party has ever wow. won six out of seven in the popular vote. But, and then if you're losing younger voters, yeah. then they tend to stay where they begin. That is, that right? is I think, that is, a real, that is the biggest challenge But how Trump bad presents. was the millennial vote then in this election? So, first of all, one way to button up the previous uh, minute we were talking about, uh, I, I often think about this. Donald Trump won exactly the same share of non-college whites as Ronald Reagan did. It was in 84. It was the most that anybody had won since 1984. But think about the difference. That vote share among non-college whites got Ronald Reagan to 59% of the total vote. It got Donald Trump to 46. Yeah, that's... So even though there are problems for Democrats in the way the electorate is dividing, particularly, I think, much more in Congress than in the, than in the, the presidential, Republicans do face this reality that they are relying on larger and larger margins from a group that is inexorably shrinking and will continue to shrink. If it didn't go back up in this election, if the non-college white share of the vote declined, even with Donald Trump and his magnetic connection with them, yeah. it's hard to see what's going to cause it to go back. And by the way, it continued to decline even in those five Midwestern states that decided the election. Just because of the demographics. Just because of the demographics. I mean. So millennials. Um, millennials in, we're, we're about to cross the threshold. In 2018, for the first time ever, millennials will be a larger share of eligible voters than baby boomers. This is a big moment for us baby boomers. So the baby boom has been the largest generation of eligible voters since 1978, 40 years. I mean, they, they passed the greatest generation in 1978 and they passed them presidentially in 1980. And I believe in 1984, they passed them as the largest group of actual voters, mm -hmm. right? So the distinction between people who are eligible to vote and the people who actually show up. Right. Um, they have been the largest generation in the electorate since then. The millennials will be the largest generation of eligible voters in 2018. Now, 
um, in 2020. Millennials is born in 1980, 81 or 82 through roughly 2000. Right. 81 through 2000 is what people describe as millennials. And in this midterm election for the first time, they will be a larger share of the potential voters, the eligible voters, the baby boomers. They will not be a larger share of the actual voters because there is still a big turnout gap. I think baby boomers are about 18 points more likely, you know, higher uh, turnout. Nonetheless, if you look at the, the way the lines are crossing, probably in 2024, if not 2022, millennials will be a larger share, not only of eligible voters, but actual voters, and it's hard, this is really hard to believe, in 2020, the first post-millennials will enter the electorate, right? Right. People born after 2000, the estimate is they will be about 3% of eligible voters yeah, in, in, 2000, in 2020. And then when you get to 2024, millennials and post-millennials are about 45% of eligible voters, and the baby boomers are about 28. So by then, certainly, they're going to be a bigger share of actual voters. And that's where I think Trump is the real is the biggest risk to the Republican Party, because you're looking at a guy who right now is an approval rating, depending on the poll, between 20 and 29 percent among millennials. The actual vote he got? He got, was... he got about the same as Romney, 35. And he got the same as Romney largely in an interesting way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in 2012, there was very little difference between the vote among college and non-college white millennials. Okay. They, Romney won them both. Won the won the non-college whites by a little more. Uh, the college whites narrowly won them over Obama. This election, they went like that. I mean, Trump won blue-collar, non-college white millennials by about 20 points. Wow. And Clinton won the college-educated white millennials by double digits. So a massive gap within the generation. Within the generation. Is that common? I guess, well, I guess maybe you saw uh, that it, in the uh, 60s, It's the widest. No, it's the widest. It's the, wi it's the widest. I look back to 2000. And it was by far the widest. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, since 2000. Well, the gap between overall, between college and non-college whites, think about it. I mean, Hillary Clinton ran 17 points better among college-educated than non-college whites. That's more than <clears throat> double the biggest gap that I've seen before, which was seven wow. in 08. Right. So the huge divergence. Anyway, okay, so millennials. We know millennials don't like the Muslim executive order. 70% of them oppose building the wall. Over 70% oppose pulling out of the climate treaty. Roughly 70% oppose the, the health care proposals. And they uh, are, you know, two-thirds to three-quarters say that Donald Trump does not reflect their values. Now, that does not mean he will not win more of them than those numbers suggest right. once there's an alternative. But he's not going to win a lot more of them than those numbers and suggest. Am I right? So in the Trump won about 35 percent, I yeah, think. Yeah, was, millennials, yeah. And Romney about the same. Yeah. And McCain probably about maybe. McCain even, won a little lower. Yeah, he got a little lower because lo Obama's first right, election. Right, Obama got two-thirds. So in three straight time. elections, if you want to be pessimistic as a third. Republican, yeah, they basically got a third of, let's say, the youth vote, youth, yes. youth yeah. young adult. I mean, young yeah. adults, yeah. Yeah, that's not a good prospect for that a party, is, not, is, that is not, no, So I on mean, the one hand, you've got a Republican Party that controls the presidency, Congress, 32, I think, governorships, yeah. two-thirds of the state legislatures, and on the other hand, they're getting one-third of the vote of the rising generation. Uh, the people who will be the biggest gener uh, generation kind of a, the electorate. Well, I mean, you it's know. It's an unusual the, situation so, somehow. And, and, and the answer may be, so like there is one kind of uh, way to kind of harmonize or make sense of these two divergent trends, which is that I think there is a lot of evidence that the groups at the core of the Republican coalition, older whites, where Trump won, where Republicans have now won 60% of whites over 45 in, se in several elections in a row, uh, blue collar whites, uh, evangelical and other religious devout whites and non-urban whites. Those are the four big groups. And yes, there are a lot. There are a lot of upper-income college, right. you know. But th those voters actually split about in half. So, but the four kind of horsemen, the four biggest groups. There is an argument that those groups are, as they feel more embattled, eclipsed, demographically, culturally, even economically that they are seeing a greater identity in the Republican Party. So Democrats are somewhat, the argument is that Democrats are on a treadmill, which is that as the white share, as, as each of those groups decline as a share of the vote, the Republican share of their votes goes up because precisely the act of retreat, you know, what David Brooks called the receding roar of the diminished white majority, is moving them further in a direction where they see the Republican Party in essence, as a white party defending their values against this urbanized, diverse, millennial America that doesn't share their values. So 
I, I, I'm pretty sympathetic to that argument. I mean, I think there is, uh, now there are obviously practical limits. I mean, there are some blue collar whites who are in unions or, you know, and maybe a candidate with Joe Biden, this probably would not have happened to this extent. Right. But the basic idea that as the demography changes, the groups that are shrinking are becoming more solidified in the Republican coalition, I think is basically right. Yeah, it's amazing. We got used to African Americans voting 90 to 10 percent for Democrats, and not just for the presidency, but in many, many races. And you know, somehow that was considered just a unique kind of block vote that you right. know, could never be replicated anywhere else. And I guess we're not going to get to 9 to 10. But, but you do get a sort of more identity politics in other groups now. Right? Not, you know, if you believe the exit polls, and they may have been slightly off, but you know, they're generally right, non-college whites voted for Trump at exactly the same percentage as Hispanics voted for Clinton. Yeah. And they were triple the share of the electorate, yeah. the non-college whites. So, you know, to the extent they, you know, Trump clearly, I mean, as, as did Buchanan, but Trump even more explicitly. I mean, I, I, I say all the time, Donald Trump make Pat Buchanan look euphemistic. Yeah. I mean, he appealed to this kind of sense of uh, white, you know, white anxiety, I think, um, and economic anxiety and cultural anxiety, the sense that we are being passed over economically, all of the growth is going, nobody who grows up around here can stay here, which I think is a very powerful and, and a, a really difficult thing for parents to deal with, uh, that the values of the society are moving away from our values, uh, and that you know we are being told all of the time that the demography of the country is changing. And by the way, President Obama, in your living room, on your television, every night provides a pretty powerful symbol that this is not you know, the America of 1955. And I think a lot of people, when Donald Trump said, make America great again, the most important word in that right. phrase was again, because it, it had a restoration kind of quality. You mentioned President Obama. I think you were a favorite of President Bill Clinton because you both kind of anticipated him and explained him, yeah. and, and he liked your analysis of American politics and liked your appreciation of what he had accomplished. What you were trying think, to do. Right? There, there, was actually a, there was actually a strategy that it wasn't all just triangulation and opportunism, right. and, but there was a vision. I think there was a vision, Yeah. as there was for Obama. But how much do you think Obama, though, it wasn't just that people saw an African-American president, but they also saw a president who didn't go out of his way, unlike Bill Clinton, yes. to reach out to them at all. Oh, how much, of, the, how much of it is the blame? Is Hillary Clinton a blame? But how much of the responsibility uh, for the hemorrhaging of the white working class vote in the Midwest, especially, is Hillary Clinton? And is some of it Barack Obama? Yeah, some of it is Barack Obama. Obama had a very different vision than Bill Clinton. I mean, Bill Clinton, first of all, if you think about it, he was marinated. He developed in the politics of Arkansas in a state, even in the late 70s and 80s, where he recognized that most vote, he, he had to convince most voters to let him do what he wanted to do with government. Their initial instinct was not you know, to allow government to expand in the ways on education and on the environment and other things that he wanted it to do. And so he was always kind of trying to figure out ways to bridge the historic goals of the Democratic Party with the suspicions of government that had developed among lower income, white, working class, rural, white voters in a state like Arkansas. And he brought that to the national level. I mean, the new, the new Democratic agenda, the Al Fromm agenda, uh, and the Bill, Bill, Will, Will Marshall and Bruce Reed right. and you know Bill Clinton, all the people who developed that, um, it was really designed to hold on to recapture white working class voters who had become the Reagan Democrats in the 80s, and that was their vision. They were trying to find a halfway point on cultural values and a way to embed government activism within a series of other conditions like balanced budget and personal responsibility yeah, that would hard work hard yeah. work yeah that would uh, rebuild support for uh, activist government among the white working class and that's how you get the crime bill of 1994 which is a classic expression of Bill Clinton Bill Clinton's vision because it is unfair to say it was just a sop to white prejudice, the, you know, the, the whites yeah. who wanted a crackdown on black uh, inner city communities. Uh, in fact, it included a lot of money for a lot of stuff. You at the, what was your thing? Project, the project for the Republic of Future. For, for project for the Republic of right. Future. We're out there bashing it for spending billions of dollars right. on social programs and, and 100,000 hiring all these guys. Midnight but, basketball. Midnight wasn't basketball that the, was yeah, in yeah. there. Um, so, I mean, what Clinton did with that and with welfare reform was basically say that the way to build 
I believe, both public support, and he also thought it was more effective. It wasn't just politics. Um, the way to expand opportunity was to both demand responsibility and provide more government help. And if you right. link the two together, you could build a coalition that you could not before. And in fact, when the welfare bill passed, these, these were in my career the highest numbers I've ever seen in polling. 90% of the country supported the welfare reform bill of 96. Six, yeah. yeah. Uh, which basically said, we're gonna, we're gonna invest more in training and daycare and childcare, but you're gonna have to work, right? And, and, and the entitlement. And that was kind of the, so you know, you fast forward 20 years, you have a democratic coalition that has evolved in a way that it is much less dependent on those culturally conservative voters. And all of those commitments that Bill Clinton made are suspect, as we saw, by the way, in the 2016 election, right. when the crime bill and NAFTA and the welfare reform bill were all used as weapons against Hillary Clinton. And there's a, you know, kind of a simple one number that kind of explains that. When Bill Clinton won in 92, whites without a college education, according to the exit poll, provided half of his votes. When Obama won in 2012, whites without a college education, according to the exit poll, provided a quarter of his votes. If you use the census, they provided slightly more, maybe a third, 35 percent. Nonetheless, the, the trend, Democrats were less dependent because of the demographic change, because of the rise of the millennials. And, you know, people forget that in the late 90s and, and even in the 2000 election, until the millennials entered the electorate, Republicans and Democrats split voters under 30 about evenly. evenly yeah. It's only when the millennials start entering that it tilts toward the Democrats. But anyway, the rise of the millennials, more uh, minorities in the electorate, more college whites voting Democratic, that has allowed Democrats to be less dependent on the voters that Bill Clinton was so focused on holding. And what that meant, above all, for Obama, is it meant that he was able to lead them across the Rubicon, where it is now a consistently, almost without exception, culturally liberal party. That's right. the big change, right? I mean, you, every, I believe every Democrat voted for the pathway to citizenship right. uh, under uh, you know, uh, in 2013. I, right. I, that would not have been true right. in Bill Clinton. Uh, there is, you know. Every the, Democrat votes for funding of Planned Parenthood, right. et cetera. It, yeah. th th that, that is the big change, and that, I believe, was enabled by the belief, and again, I think I, you know, a lot of stuff I wrote has contributed to the belief that Democrats, in fact, are less dependent on the white working class than they used to be. The, the, the caveat always was that, that that does not mean you can fall through the floor. You're right. I mean, you have to, particularly in those Midwestern states, and that was always, as I said, the, the, the um, uh, I think the phrase I used once was the Democratic dominance in the Electoral College depended on an act of political levitation, which was that they kind of levitated above their national number among those working class whites in the Midwest where they were still more plentiful. Even though they're shrinking, there's still half the vote or more in all of those states that, hmm. I, that I talked about, at least in the Midwest side. So and why, why incidentally did they succeed in that? It's not as if Obama was a natural... Uh, or Kerry, I mean, yeah. uh, um, Gore. I mean, it's funny that they would have done so well in a way in the Midwest. Yes. Um, well, I think it is mostly because they were able to paint the Republican. It was That's more about that. Yeah. They were able to paint the Republican as a class enemy. There's also more of a union. Yeah, I think holds over. Right. Jeff Garron once said to me something I think really, uh, uh, I think, ha had a lot to it. He said, Jeff Garron. Jeff Garron is a Democratic pollster. He was, he was the chief strategist for Clinton 08. He was the chief strategist for the priorities pack this time, which was the super PAC supporting Clinton. But in 2012, when this was happening, because uh, I wrote a story in 2012 that Democrats were running in, in Arizona and Colorado, I'm sorry, in Virginia, uh, North Carolina, Colorado, say. They were running the campaign that Hillary Clinton ran in 2016. This is in 2012. They were running basically social liberalism aimed at college-educated whites, especially women. Those were the ads. You know, Mitt Romney is going to defund Planned Parenthood. He's going to uh, 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 affect abortion, that kind of thing. In the Midwest, though, they were running... Mitt Romney was the guy who came to town in the limo and shut down the factory and sucked. They were running Bruce Springsteen songs, right? They were running Youngstown and right, right. Uh, Death to My Hometown. And what Jeff said was that, and I think there's a lot to this, that there is a shared narrative in the Midwest. People feel that pain. They know Youngstown. Right? They know those factories that are gone. And they were, the Democrats have been able to tap into that. Uh, and attach the Republicans to that. And, and that just isn't the story. There isn't right. that story in the Sun Belt yeah. of that kind of loss and failure and regression. And then Trump upended it all because he seemed to be at once uh, targeting all of the class enemies of the white working class. You know, the, 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 what they saw as the unvirtuous poor below them, 
the government that was indifferent to them, and then the corporate leadership that was abandoning them. He attacked all of them. He was right. omnidirectional. And liberal elites, obviously. And the elites, yeah. and liberal elites who are culturally right. uh, condescending to them. So it was a pretty good match. And speaking of the Democrats, what about Sanders? So, I mean, what does that mean? So uh, Sanders is, I, look, I, you know, when, whenever a party faces, a, and I, I think you probably know this better than I, when a party faces a crossroads, the answer is almost always not either or. It's always some of both. Because you can't, you can't put all of your eggs in one basket, as Hillary Clinton showed us again. You cannot depend solely on the coalition of the ascendant or the kind of the changing demography. Um, but I do think that Sanders does represent an important crossroads. Because essentially, there are two visions, I think, of how Democrats can come back against Donald Trump. One is that they find a way to win back a significant number of white working class, the white working class voters, the guys in Flint right. and Gary, well, not so much Indiana, but you know, in, in, in Flint right. and in Altoona and in Lackawanna County and all of those places, you find a way to win them back. Uh, voters who had voted for you before to you know, larger numbers than they do now and then stampeded toward Trump. And if you wanna win them back, you know, the, the, the dominant theory among Democrats is you go in a Sanders-Warren direction toward, you know, just turn up the populism to 11. Just, you know, bang at rich people, bang at Wall Street, promise, you know, universal programs, and we're going to defend you. Um, there's another point of view, which I, which I think has, I think, more, at this point at least, statistical merit, which says that you have a better chance of beating Trump by further, making further gains in the white-collar, white suburbs where the voters were the most ambivalent about him to begin with. And um, it is a given that any Democrat is going to have to do better than Hillary Clinton at turning out minority voters. But I think the core choice, and there is a real choice here, is do you have someone who, like Sanders, aims populism at the white working class? The risk of that is that that will fail to bring those voters back from Trump because he, he holds them so tightly on cultural grounds. Right. And in the process, by going full bore populist, you will alienate the slightly right of center on economic issues, white collar white voters right. who are otherwise open to you because they really loathe Trump and they do not think he should be president on personal qualities. So I think that is a, that is a consequential choice for Democrats because if you elect Sanders, you're probably limiting your ability to make further gains in Oakland County, Michigan, and in, uh, Berg, you know, in, in the suburbs of Atlanta and places like that, uh, and you're betting that you're going to go back into Macomb County, you're going to go back into Flint, County, you know, Flint, and you're going to win back those voters with populism because it's going to be hard for Bernie Sanders to do, or, or Elizabeth Warren probably more realistically, you know, you know, Sanders is going to be, what, 78, 79? It's going to be hard for them to do a lot better in white-collar, white America than Clinton did. They might have trouble holding all of that vote. The one advantage that I have to say that I have not fully factored in is that Sanders does have a magnetic connection with young people. Yeah, what is that about? I could say honestly. That is hard to. Well, I mean, I think. Look, I mean, I think the when, when you talk to voters all year, I guess, he, you know, he. Point. That's it. That's the word, right? He beat her among voters under thirty by more than Obama did in '08. Yeah, that's amazing. That is amazing, right? It's one thing to lose young voters to Obama of '08. The Obama of that Pulitzer Prize-winning photo in the rain, you know, with the collar up. I mean, just this fierce, historical, transformative, charismatic figure. Okay, yeah. Okay, you're talking about like a 74-year-old socialist who's a dead ringer for Larry David. Right. And he beat her by more. So weaknesses for her, but there is, and look, even Jeremy Corbyn turned out a lot of young people. All right. So, um, you know, for those who believe that the Sanders-Warren path is, has, is very rocky, because you know, it really depends on how much you think you can win back of the white working class from Trump. You have to win back some, you do. I, I, I think anybody would agree with that if you're gonna beat him. But how much is realistically possible when he speaks to so many of their grievances on so many fronts? I mean, even if he doesn't bring a lot of jobs back to Flint, he has picked up the phone and yelled at the head of Ford and GM for moving, you know, and, and effort goes a long way in politics. Well, that's what I wanna ask you. So he's governing now. Yes. And so part of me thinks, look, if you're running as the kind of protest candidate against yeah a culturally uh, sophisticated cosmopolitan and condescending Democratic Party and Barack Obama's pretty good, you mm -hmm. know, and Hillary Clinton, not a bad duo to run against in right, a sense. Right. Uh, and you're the challenger and you've been out of office eight years and normally there's just the general sense right. of uh, time for a change. 
you can squeak out a victory. But you have to govern for four mm. years. Can you just run, rerun that campaign of grievance and I, kind of white Identi working class identity, identity politics? politics? Don't people ask for, that, where are the jobs? Now maybe right. some will come back. But what, well, if, what if they don't really? First or, of all, I think that is, that is their vision. I mean, there is nothing about this presidency that on any front is about broadening. Right. right? There is nothing style or substance or policy that is about in any way speaking to the 54% of the country that did not vote for him. No. They, I, I think they believe that if they can hold what they have and energize it, they can win again. I think that is a debatable proposition. Yeah, it seems you like an should odd be able, proposition yeah, if, if you, don't, you lost you, the popular vote right, by 3 million votes. Right, well, and, if you, and also not only that, but you got to 46. I mean, if, if, if you're the Democratic Party and two elections in a row, you can't beat somebody who can't get above 46, that's double negative, but if you can't beat right. somebody who's stuck at 46 or below, that, that would be surprising. Yeah. Um, and I would not be surprised if by the time we get to 2020, somewhere, somehow, in Trump land, there will be an effort to subtly encourage a third-party candidate because he has a better chance of winning as it gets lower. So on the, first, the first point is he is not governing in a way that is making any effort to reach out to voters beyond his coalition. Second, if you look at the polling, he is clearly reinforcing the doubts on the personal qualities and characteristics that existed you know, in, in, um, in 2016. One-fifth of, uh, you know, 20% of the voters, over 20% of the voters roughly uh, said that he was not qualified and he did not have the temperament to succeed. Over uh, roughly a fourth of his voters said he did not have the temperament to succeed. But they wanted change. They didn't like Hillary Clinton. They wanted to take a chance. The risk he faces is that particularly with those white-collar whites, he is making that, he, there's nothing happening that is making that better. Let's put it that way. If you went into this election as an ambivalent Trump voter, right. and your ambivalence was less about policy than it was about the personal qualities, and whether this was someone who was really kind of suited to be the most powerful man in the world, I don't think there's a lot that's happened in the last five months that have reassured you. Right. I mean, people still see him as like a disruptive force, fighting for change. They like, you know, a lot of people like that but they see him as erratic, they see him as impulsive, they see him as ill-informed. He is not reassuring. And then what is, on the governing front, probably the most complex challenge is he did run as a different kind of Republican, to, right. you know, to, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, and he basically said, I am going to champion the interest of working class communities across the board. And, you know, some ways that collided with Democrats on immigration, say, or on uh, I'm going to unleash the police to protect. Right, right. But there were areas where it, the collision was greater with Republicans. Right. And that is on protecting programs that help lower middle class, you know, working class and older voters. Um, do you know that two thirds of everybody in the country between the ages of 45 and 64 are white? And Donald Trump dominated among whites 45 to 64. They are the, by far the biggest losers in the health care bill. Right, yeah. older working age adults in the last two decades before, and the health care bill I think is the perfect little emblem of the challenge he's facing, integrating his working class nationalist populism into the sm traditional more small government and Randian conservatism right. of say Ryan and I don't know what McConnell is. McConnell's just, McConnell is get to fifty. The, right, the, right. So uh, the health care bill is a is you know is is a perfect model of the challenge he faces because. The Congressional Party has steered it in a way that reflects tra more traditional Republican goals than Trump talked about, but which violate exactly what he promised during the campaign, that he should protect these lower middle income uh, and working class, you know, um, and older white voters. You look at the premium numbers, you look at the Medicaid numbers, you look at the states that are dealing with the opioid crisis. Right. They are all among the biggest losers in this plan, and that's, I think, you know, uh, taxes and the budget raise similar issues. Can you be truly a working class populist party uh, and at a time when many of those voters support government activism, can you integrate that as long as it benefits them? Can you, everybody, everybody in the Republican coalition is fine with cutting food stamps, right. okay? Uh, even though those now benefit, you go to Kentucky or West Virginia, I mean, who's on food stamps? Right. They're Trump voters. Right. So I think this is, the, this is the big structural challenge for governing. And you could also argue, at least I've argued that it's like the health care bill in particular, but one can imagine the same will be true of tax reform if that ever develops. It's sort of the worst of both worlds. I mean, it's not a success. It doesn't actually reward the Trump voters, the populist, uh, working class whites uh, in, in a practical mm -hmm. sense. It, it, it hurts them, if anything, or at least can be portrayed as right. hurting them. 
but it doesn't actually embody any great conservative principle mm -hmm. either right. of huh. rolling back government or limiting mm -hmm. government or markets. You know, we're finally going to have a health care system that insurance that works like car insurance works fine, right? But it's not attached to employers. You can imagine a bold kind yeah. of free market agenda. It would be mm -hmm. risky, but it might have appeal across, actually across class, li mm -hmm. cross class lines. But they don't, they've sort of got neither with this now. Yeah, the it strikes only, me as, it's, you know. The uh, only part of it that is more conventional Republican really is on the Medicaid side, is rolling back yes. Medicaid. I mean, the Republicans, Ronald Reagan talked about block granting Medicaid. Bush proposed, W proposed to block grant Medicaid. But the difference, I think, the difference is that, um, again, it goes to this, this larger question. Um, Obama, the, the, the ACA, as you know, raised eligibility for Medicaid right. up the income ladder for the first time really into the lower middle income working population. Right. At precisely the same time, Trump was r lowering the Republican coalition's reach down right. in the income ladder. And the two lines now overlap. I mean, right. you, look at, you look at a state like West Virginia or Ohio or Kentucky or Maine, and who is going to get hurt yeah. by the Medicaid rollback? It is older and lower middle income voters. And in those states, those are whites who vote for Donald Trump. And that is a real perilous, in terms of 2020, I mean, Democrats, I mean, I think Democrats feel that if Trump reneges on his promises to protect Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, that would be the biggest vulnerability. It's perilous if it happens. I think it's much more perilous just politically if it becomes law, because yeah. then things start to happen. I mean, some of them don't happen until right, after 2020, right. but at least no. it's sort of like, this is going to happen, this is the law of the land. If it fails, people vaguely remember. Yeah. Right, they're but, probably better off if it fails. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And then Trump can still be their champion. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and there's no actual concrete thing to put in the, in the scales in against the ads, them, I suppose. Yeah. Um, what about the two parties? I mean, so the picture we've painted here, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the parties are getting more like themselves, so to speak, and mm -hmm. more entrenched. And the two, country, the two Americas are growing more apart. Right. Well, first, let's say a word about that geographically, because I think, yeah. how does that affect the House and the Senate? Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, one of the biggest advantages Republicans have is that, this Demo is that the modern Democratic coalition is overly concentrated into a few big places. You know, we were talking about before, I mean, Democrats have won the popular vote in six of the past seven presidential elections, which no party has ever done since 1828. I mean, so they have a big coalition nationally fueled by these demographic changes. But even over that period, even before you get Donald Trump, over those, what, the last 26 years, they will have held the House for six years. Yeah, that's amazing. And in the, in the Senate, uh, they, you know, we've had the Senate about, about evenly divided. I think it's 14 and 12 uh, over that, that same period. And, you know, essentially the story is that the demographic and economic changes that are benefiting Democrats are not universally distributed around the country and in the places that are not being reshaped by diversity, whether it's states, interior states, you know, like the Montanas and the Kansas and uh, so forth, or uh, even more pointedly within states, as you get outside of those dense metropolitan areas that are diverse, post-industrial, secular, you know, pick, you know, pick the adjective, they are, th their ability to compete has kind of fallen off the table. So even though they have, uh, and, and, and in essence, what happened, I think, in 2016, one of the things that happened in 2016 is the problems, the geographic problems that Democrats have had in the House and the Senate extended to the Electoral College Yeah, for the first time. That's a time. good way of putting it. Yeah. They kind of drew an inside straight in the Electoral College, but it was right. based on, you might say, It was say, based on what we had seen on the House map. And that's much more important what you've been describing than gerrymandering, right? I, I mean, gerrymandering I is a it's, few It's states. kind of the icing on the cake. I mean, gerrymandering yeah. makes it worse, but the sorting and the concentration and of Democrats. And how much of it is Voting Rights Act, majority minority districts, a little bit a little of that bit, too, a little, little bit too much South. concentration of Democrats yeah, yeah, in too much concentration. inner cities. Yeah, I mean, Democrats have all of these districts that they win, you know, by enormous margins. Right. Um, but I mean, the core problem, I mean, the, 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 the geographic uh, uh, concentration is part of it, but also realistically, this is where the, the view that you can survive without any competitiveness in the white working class becomes more problematic because you can win, they have proven you can win the White House with pretty miserable numbers among blue collar whites. But you, you really can't win the House on a sustained basis because, you know, again, the diversity hasn't uh, uh, dispersed enough right. to make it possible to win the House on a regular basis unless you can be a little more competitive uh, in places that are still predominantly white, predominantly working class, and pretty religious. And in off-year elections, they, they vote more, too. They vote so more, too. Know, it's a list. I mean, it is amazing. Just one last point. I'm looking backwards in a way. I, I mean, in 04, as I recall, the yes. two, the, Ohio was the state we waited for. And I don't mm -hmm. think, you know, it wasn't called till 2 a.m. or something. Right. Kerry didn't concede till the right. next morning. And the other state that was super close was Iowa. 
Yeah. I think it's 5,000 votes. Mm. I think Bush won it, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. right. That was the one time in the last six. Ohio and Iowa in 2016 were, were plus, what, nine oh, and 12 we Republican totally, or something? Right. We totally blew and, out and, the and, doors. And Ohio was, comp was contested. And, I mean, they heavily spent contested. Iowa, heavily, heavily less contested. Iowa, they kind of right. gave up they on at some point. Were, but still, that is really remarkable. Right, uh, it is. And, you know, in the long run, I do believe that in the long run, uh, the Democrats' fu Democratic future is more North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, and Colorado right. than it is some of those Midwestern states because they are aging. Uh, they are not diversifying very much. Um, they, the Midwestern states. They, the Midwestern yeah. states, are aging and, and, and remaining predominantly white at a time when older whites are becoming more Republican and, and probably will continue to become more Republican. I mean, this treadmill idea, I think, I, you know, I don't think we know enough to say for sure, but the idea that as older blue-collar religious whites feel increasingly eclipsed, they, they, they increasingly look to the Republican Party as their kind of defender and savior, seems to me plausible. So if that's the case, yes, over time, Democrats have to find a way to break through in the Sun Belt. And the answer to that, by the way, is... But they pretty, will. Right? I mean, I mean that's, won't North Carolina be the next Virginia and well, et cetera? Yeah, Arizona yeah, will be the next Colorado yeah, or whatever, whatever yeah, metaphor you want. Yeah, right? the, but the key to that is, is very straightforward. I mean, it, it is two things. It's turning out somewhat more minorities, but the biggest thing is winning more college whites because they don't win as many college whites in the sun, some of those Sun Belt states as they do in... Uh, like Colorado, they win 52, 53% of college whites. It's pretty safe. Uh, Virginia, they win 44, and it's fine. They win, they're now pretty safe in Virginia. I'd be shocked if they don't win the governor's race in Virginia this year. But in North Carolina, that goes down to the high 30s. Right. So it's not quite enough. So the college whites are just And then in Georgia, them. it's in the 20s. Yeah. And in Texas, it's in the 20s. They've got to get those up to the mid-30s, probably. You, get, you win a third of college whites in Georgia and Texas, and you win them. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. But they can't get there yet. Now, this overall discussion seems to me to, ha I mean, you've described a picture of the two parties as they're getting more like themselves, more separate mm -hmm. from each other, right. uh, consolidating their own supporters. And presumably this goes on. It's somewhat evenly matched. Not, right. Well, it's pretty closely matched. Pretty closely matched. Yeah. The Republicans have this geographic advantage, and Democrats kind of have a demographic advantage. Yeah. Right. And, and, um, but somehow one sometimes looks at the whole yeah. system and think, I don't know. Is, uh, the parties are so stale. The kind of you got Sanders and the Democrats, Trump and the Republicans. Maybe there'll be a breakup. What about a Macron possibility? Yeah. A centrist? Something? There is. There was sentiment in 2016 for a Bloomberg type candidate. I mean, he polled it. He did pretty well. I think in his polling, but not well enough. He thought to run. Um, I don't know. What about that? I mean, are we right? I'm, I'm not. I'm not. So this is a real. It's a great question, and I'm not smart enough to kind of see entirely around the corner of where this may go. What we can say is we know, as we said, that all of the, the geographic and demographic sorting that goes back to the 60s, but certainly really accelerates in the 80s and 90s, it has moved to a point that seems, you know, how much further can it go, right? right? I mean, it... it I, and also to a point that's as a governing matter, is ends up being un, ungovernable, un, unsatis, unsatisfactory, even for partisans of both sides. Well, uh, for, you know among I mean? other things, among other things, we're now in the situation where every four years we tear up what happened the previous four years, and we're like, we're going to start over on energy and health care every four years. Right. I mean, it's a crazy way to run a big country. Right. You know, utilities invest in power plants that are supposed to last for 45 years. Would you build a power plant today on the assumption that Donald Trump has irrevocably changed the direction of policy and that over the next 44, 45 years, no one is going to care how much carbon you emit? Right. I mean, who would make that investment? No. Um, so it, it's not a very functional system, but it has a lot of internal logic. There's a lot of centrifugal force in it. It's getting deeper and deeper. I mean, and Trump is a president who's perfectly comfortable with this environment. And in fact, is trying to reinforce it. I mean, all of his attacks on the fake news uh, are really, I think, about encouraging his voters to discount right. critical voices and look only at the sources that are, you know, complementary to him. He's perfectly comfortable, as we said before, trying. So there's a lot going. But you look at this. You say, how can this go on? And, right. and right, you you knew Herb Stein, and the the famous Herb Stein rule. Any what was it? Any trend that can't be sustained won't be. I mean, yeah. essentially. Yeah, things can't. Go, you know, it's like with welfare. I think people on welfare is going up two percent every right. three years or something. So, but of course, eventually you get to hundred percent. It's not going to go. You know, people watch the press conference in June in uh, in D.C. where John Kasich and John Hickenlooper were stood there condemning the Republican health care bill together. And people say, well, that's kind of interesting, right? I mean, that's kind of a, you know, how would that ticket do against Elizabeth Warren and Donald Trump? Right. Uh, that would be the ultimate, that would be the Macron ticket, urban, suburban, white-collar, reasonable, uh, uh, you know, 
might make it easier for Trump to win by lowering the, you know, lowering the number. But look, I do think that there are strains in both parties, right? Because you do have a Trump populism that is at odds with a kind of a more centrist, more white collar Republicanism. And then you have a Sanders populism that's more at odds with a uh, white collar DLC ish uh, Democrat. And the, and the minority voters are kind of a third force who don't really fit into either of those. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the fissures, the, the thing could recombine in different ways because this is not very functional. Well, that's the thing. I think it's both getting deep, as you said, it's both an internal logic but also an external illogic. illogic. Right, it does. And right. somehow, how does that all work out? It's, and it does, I mean, with Trump especially, it sort of depends on results. And so if there's a semi-failed Trump, it seems to be the only way you get to the Macron thing is a semi-failed Trump presidency that's not failed enough to deny him renomination. So it's not LBJ okay. in 68. Yeah. But it's, you know, Carter or something like that. He gets primary, but he survives, mm-hmm. has his base. But the base is now... Kasich? Kasich well, primaryism? I don't know, someone, yeah. Yeah. But then the Democrats go left, I suppose, yes, for right, this scenario, right. I think. Right. Yeah. The, then the there Democrats, is a pretty, and maybe they've won the House in the meantime, yes. and have done things in the House that look just like well, they, sort of wacky Trump. left. Yeah, they may have impeached Trump. Mm-hmm. And that is, maybe then you do have your sort of, let's call it Pelosi, Warren, Democrats, and Trump yeah. Republicans. And then you have the, then you have then a then Kasich, you have a Kasich uh, centrist Democrat. I mean, I, it's not impossible to imagine uh, as John Anderson ran against Ronald Reagan in 1980 and ran as an independent, uh, I could imagine a world where John Kasich primaries Trump, gets very close to beating him in New Hampshire, which is a pretty white-collar electorate, uh, you know, rallies kind of suburban right. Republicans, but probably fall shorts in the, fall, falls short in the end. Um, although it is worth noting that now in the GOP primary, it is almost exactly 50-50 college and non-college. Hmm. And the reason Donald Trump won over 17 other candidates is that he consolidated the non-college side. Now, that's side. compared to what it used, what did it well, used it would to have be? Been, it would have been, uh, well, it, I, I don't know going back that far, but it, um, it, it would have tilted. I mean, the, the college share is going up nationally. Like, for right. example, in the Democratic primary, it's going up. And I think it, it, it's been, uh, the blue-collar share has been holding and growing in the Republican side. Um, but Trump won an incredible share, basically half of all non-college Republicans in a field with 17 other candidates. No one won more than a third of the, of the college Republicans. Yeah, that's that's how he won. I mean, he consolidated one wing and the other wing divided. That was the one sentence. Right. Um, so I could imagine Kasich, or Sass, but more likely Kasich, running against Trump and doing pretty well, but not winning. Uh, and then if the Democrats went far enough left, saying, all right, you know what? I'm going to go find me Bill Bradley or... Uh, you know, someone right. former Bob Kerry. Uh, you know, uh, you know, pick, right. pick out your name. Uh, these are former Democratic senators or kind of centrist senators, uh, and I'm going to run as a third party candidate against Elizabeth Warren and Donald Trump. I mean, that would be an independent candidacy, which uh, might hard. have a shot. I mean, Perot was at once at 35 percent and looked like right. he might have a chance. It's diff- whether it's that would then. Lead. I guess what? if you won, it might then lead to an actual party. It's yes. not really. I mean, do you think it happens in America, bottom up? Things start Top happening down. at the state level. No. I do too. I'm I, think, of- I think if somebody wins the presidency and creates a party, the problem is like here's the problem: is that the states are so polarized now right. that you have the risk of finishing second everywhere. Yes. you finish second to the Democrat in California and second to the Republican. I think in Texas. that's what Bloomberg found when he polled this in 2016 and yeah. privately and his people, and they were serious about it. And I right. think he didn't run because he thought, ironically, yeah. that he would elect Trump. I mean, and he, he might be. He, he might thought be, he would take votes from Hillary. Yeah, and he might have been York. second in 30 states. Yes, exactly. But he never could quite figure out. How he either wins the electoral college or even forces it into the, the house, the house which doesn't do you any good because then you just, then you just complicate like Trump. Well, unless the Republicans are looking for an excuse not to, but I mean that would be complicated. Maybe right. they would select right. the one with the most popular vote, but but yeah. They, that no, but your your instinct I think is right. I mean it's hard to you know it's hard for me to imagine. I, I I don't know what the next act is, but it is hard to imagine that we keep doing this over the next you know 20 right. 25 years and I'm that I'm before I go to the you know the political uh, the, the press box in the sky um, uh, hopefully a little more than 20 uh, you know but uh, I, I think that uh, it's hard to imagine that we keep doing right. this but it's also hard to see who coalesces the forces the best possibility is the scenario you described though Trump you know holds on to primarily the blue collar wing of the Republican party that shares his you know fervor his his the the, the enemies that he arrays, uh, the Democrats go left, and you have a very large number of white collar, and not only whites, but minorities in many cases, yeah, I think, who kind of feel like, mm, I don't know, 
whether I fit in any of this. And that's, that's, you can imagine a scenario where a Kasich or Hickenlooper kind of thing could get 20, 25% of the vote, but can they win any states? And can they get 35% of the vote, which is what you sort of would need to win states? Start winning states, if yeah. 40%, really. Right. Now, that is the question. Well, that's an interesting speculation. Um, what else haven't we thought of? 2018, do you have a yeah. particular view? Of yeah, I mean, um, so look, I mean, the, the challenge for Democrats is that among, uh, in addition to the geographic challenge they face, in the House, which is real. I mean, it's a big problem. They have a second problem, which is that they have this boom and bust coalition. They depend on young people and minorities. And they both, but especially young people, turnout collapses. In the, in the last two elections, from 08 to 10 and 12 to 14, turnout among 18 to 29 has dropped by more than half. Wow. That's killer. I mean, so I, from the presidential to the, the, off the year, next midterm, fewer than half of the same people vote. vote. And, you know, they're winning. 50, you know, in a bad year, they win 57% of people under 30. In a good year, they're now winning 60. Against Trump, they have a potential to win 65% of voters under 30. Um, and conversely, Trump's best group, as I said, are whites over 45. So if you look at the last several midterms, uh, the, you, we see the share of the vote cast by young people fall from about 19% in the presidential to 12% in the midterm. And then the share cast by seniors goes up correspondingly. Right. That can't happen again if Democrats are going to win the House. And, and you know, th this is the big debate. Um, has Trump activated that? And I think there is some evidence the answer is yes. What do you think from the special election so far? This I, a lot of people turned out. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people. It seems to me like the Democrats yeah. are consistently picking up. Uh, are picking up. Five, six, seven percent now, above now the, the, the Hillary Clinton level. Yeah. Yeah, and the question is whether Republicans can, can replicate what they were able to do in Georgia 6, which was they turned out a lot of Republicans. Yeah, I'm not about the Hillary Clinton level, but above their previous Above the, oh, 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 the House levels, it's way up, yeah. way up. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, so I think, you know, we know what people think pretty much. I don't think it's going to change that much by 2018. We know that Trump is still relatively strong in blue-collar white America. He has abysmal numbers among millennials. He has abysmal numbers among minorities. And he is underperforming any Republican ever, president ever, with college whites. So you, I think that, that will be true a year from now. I, I don't think that's going to be really different a lot. I mean, it could, be, it could be a little worse for him. It could be a little better. Um, I don't think it's going to be that different. So the question is twofold. One, who comes out? And second, to what degree can the Republicans in vulnerable places, which are mostly these suburban white collar yeah. places, separate themselves right. from Trump? Historically, over the modern era, as we've gotten more polarized, routinely, people who approve of the president, 85% of the vote for his party's candidates in the House, 85% disapprove voting. Yeah, so if Trump's only 38 or 40%, that they is a the negative House. indicator. They should lose they the should House. They should lose that. So that's what I'm thinking, House. too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, now, if, again, Democrats have this extra problem of turnout, uh, but if he's at 38 or 40 and they don't lose the House, I think, Dem or come, or come, you know, get right on the 28, you know, 219, uh, Democrats have to win 24 seats. There are 23 Republicans in districts that Clinton carried. Most of them, two thirds of them, are in heavily white collar suburban districts. Um, you know, a Democrat gets from 38 percent against Tom Price to what was it, 48 percent right. for John Ossoff in the suburbs of Atlanta. If you're running Mike Kaufman in the suburbs of Denver or Pat Meehan in the suburbs of Philadelphia or Leonard Lance in the suburbs of New Jersey, you don't like that. Because right. southern suburbanites are more conservative than the suburbanites we're talking about there. So they have a shot, no guarantee. Uh, it really depends on who votes. And then, of course, the dynamics. This is why the next three years are going to be very yeah. interesting in their own crazy way. And maybe they're, I mean... I, I don't know if they're as Trump dependent as we've been saying. Maybe they are, though, ultimately, because he's the president. The presidents are, presidents are important mm -hmm. in American politics. But, I mean, of course, what happens with Mueller? Is there an impeachment or not? I mean, Absolutely. That is, that is a huge, It's a know, huge wild card. Right. People are underestimating it. I mean, either he reports, presumably, in early, mid-2018, I'm guessing. Yes. I think it'll be soon, not late 2018. Either he reports to Congress, yes, there are things you should consider for impeachment, a la Ken Starr, or he says no, and that changes the dynamic an awful lot, you know, mm -hmm. just think if about he, that. If, if he reports, I mean, if he reports that, um, you know, I, I could imagine a scenario in which he accepts the Justice Department memos from the Watergate era and 2000. Twice the Justice Department has written OLC, Office of Legal yeah. Counsel. These, these don't have the force of law, but they are internal policy that a sitting president cannot be indicted. Criminally. Right. So it is entirely possible to me, anyway, that being a good, smart prosecutor, he says, look, I can't indict the president, so I'm not going to answer the question of whether he committed a criminal act because it's meaningless. What I can tell you is he did these things right. that 
you should be looking at. Right. Well, that's what the referral to Congress is, was, really. Right. I mean, Starr didn't tell them to impeach. He right. said, right. you need to consider these right. things. Right. But he, now, Starr did say that he, he thought he committed criminal acts. Actually. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. 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 But um, uh, anyway, but if, if, they, if he drops that in their lap and they do nothing, Right. Um, you know, I think that's a real gamble, obviously, with these voters who are ambivalent at best about right. Trump. What if he says, however, that, you know, Mike, Michael Flynn did X and shouldn't have, and maybe there's some criminal indictments with Fulton Manafort. I don't mean to slander people here on the show, but whatever, you know, that's yeah. all possible. But, but basically nothing, Trump may have been imprudent, he may have been, you know, reckless, he said but, some but, but he didn't quite reach the level of real obstruction or real collusion. Well, then uh, Trump that would be kind of, interesting. Then Trump, then would, impeachment's off. Right, right. And which is, and Democrats is that are probably, help? I, I think Democrats are probably, first of all, I think, I, I don't know what you, I'm not sure what you think. I think if Democrats win the House and their first act is to impeach Trump, that would be a big mistake. Yeah, I totally, I think the more the election of 2018 or even 2020 is about impeachment, ironic, this is sort of weirdly country, mm -hmm. ironic, but it's worse for the Democrats. Yeah. If 2018 even is a referendum on impeachment, mm. I think a lot of people think because, because a lot, and also, get nervous, also, like, really, and a lot of we just elected him, the right. Republicans come out. It's like, I don't know. I mean, he's maybe not, he's a, I may want to vote against him in 2020. I can imagine my, neighbor, yeah, my can, neighbors in Northern Virginia saying, but do they really want Nancy Pelosi's house to impeach him in 2019? That's a little different. I mean, different. I, can, I can imagine, without too much trouble, a pretty plausible two-front argument against Trump in 2020. On the one hand, for the Democrats, um, on the one hand, you basically go to white collar America and you say, this guy was every bit as unqualified as you were afraid. Right. Plus, he's leading us backward. I mean, he's trying to restore the economy right. of 1955. Right. And, uh, you know, he's, he's abandoning climate. He's abandoning clean energy jobs. He's closing off the world. I mean, there's, there's a pretty clear case. And then on the other track, uh, you go to blue collar America and you say what they were what they talked about in 2015. He is a false tribune. He doesn't really right. have your interests at heart. He's, he's, a, he's a plutocrat. I right. mean, he, he cut taxes for rich people and gave you scraps. Right. He took away your health care, if that's. Um, that seems to me, you know, a pretty plausible two-track case against him. And he'll obviously have his counter arguments. Um, you don't really need to, you know, kind of feed the beast by right. impeaching him. You may maybe but Mueller may report, well, and that would be and, something. And then and look, and then Mueller reports, then you then you may have to. And also, the internal logic of everything we've been talking about is that they will impeach him. And the le and the last election, um, the only midterm election we've ever, I'd say, had uh, where impeachment was front and center. Republicans helped did the, better. Helped the party first that was time Clinton. Since, yeah, first time since eighteen thirty four, I think. First time since eighteen thirty four. The the the, um, the president's party gained right. seats in the so second. So wouldn't that midterm. be a bizarre, you know, yeah. uh, kind of weird contrarian thing, but I'm not sure that would happen. Well, who knows? It's going to be a very interesting three oh. or four years. We'll have to have this conversation maybe every year. Every can, year, we'll, yeah. We'll update people on this, but this has been fascinating. Thank a you, terrific Bill. historical perspective and uh, thought-provoking in all kinds of ways. And so, Ron, thanks for joining thanks me for today. Thanks for having me. And thanks for joining us on Conversations.